This week, I've been throwing and trimming a number of these lighter bowls. The processes of both I'll show you in this video, together with a little discussion about the tools I use towards the end. So stick around if you want to find out which tools I'm using and where I get them. As always, this process starts on the wedging table. This particular method is called spiral wedging, whereby the clay is folded over and over again in this particular manner, which eventually pushes out all the pockets of air and any inconsistencies that might also be in the clay. Ideally, when throwing on the potter's wheel, you want a clay that's absolutely homogenous and even. If it isn't, you'll find these air pockets and inconsistencies in clay texture can cause issues later on when you're throwing the clay. In the future, I plan on getting a pug mill to do this process for me, but at the moment I can get by pretty well without one. Each one of the bowls I throw in this video weighs three pounds, which is 1,360 grams but initially I tend to wedge up larger lumps which I then separate into smaller ones for throwing. For those wondering, this is a high iron stoneware clay body that's manufactured to be reduction fired. The red hue of the clay simply comes from all the red iron oxide it contains and it looks wonderful when heavily reduced, but if fired in an oxidized atmosphere, it shows far less character. Once wedged up, I separate and weigh out the clay lumps and you can see where it's sliced, just how much smoother the clay body appears as compared to when it started out being wedged at the beginning of this video. Preparing your clay properly is so crucial. If you skip this step or do it poorly, especially for larger vessels, you'll only create more issues for yourself later on down the line. Once weighed out, I give each piece another quick spiral wedge just to bring together all the weighed out pieces. I'm often asked about the material of my wedging table, and truth be told, it isn't anything particularly special, but it does the job very well. The wooden surface is simply a large sheet of 18mm birch ply, which is slightly absorbent, which helps when wedging out clay like this. If, for some instance, I'm wedging up clay that's much softer, I'll do so in one of my plaster bats, as they're far more absorbent, and they'll draw out some of the moisture in the clay and perhaps most importantly, the clay doesn't stick to them nearly so much. And finally, once all the clay has been weighed out and wedged up, it's time to start throwing. I make these bowls on wooden bats, which are attached to a thin skim of clay that's thrown onto the wheel head. This means that when I'm finished throwing, I can lift away the wooden platform with the bowl on it, rather than lifting off the bowl by itself, which, as this is quite a large overhanging piece, you would very likely distort the bowl if you were to lift it off with just your hands. I make sure the lump of clay is well stuck down and give it a good tap, and then I can start to centre. I cover the lump of clay with water, and then, by anchoring my right arm into my torso, I lean my body weight onto the ball of clay, while simultaneously squeezing it into the centre. Once it's been roughly centred, I'll then proceed to cone the clay up and down a number of times. The process of coning the clay is really just like wedging but on the wheel. It helps to align all the clay particles, the platelets, and creates a ball of clay that's far easier to throw. Throughout this entire process, if you ever feel like the lump of clay is becoming too dry, just simply add more water or some slip, as when the clay dries it'll stick to your hands, and that's one of the many reasons that the lump of clay can sometimes suddenly become off-centred. For these larger bowls, I start off with a low, wide shape. This will provide me with enough clay on the outside to act as support for the overhanging walls of the bowl. I then create a hole in the middle and open it up gradually, making sure to leave enough thickness in the base from which I'll be able to trim a nice tall footring from later on. For these, I'd say I leave about a centimetre and a half in the bottom, which these days I can observe simply by looking at the interior base of the bowl and comparing it to the wood on the outside and seeing the difference in level between them. I then grab a large amount of clay between my knuckle on the outside and my fingers on the inside, and I squeeze it upward. This is a process that's done very gradually and very evenly, in one consistent motion. Issues arise when you pull inconsistently, when you hesitate or change the pressure between your fingers. Then, when my fingers reach the top, I just let go very gently. If you release your fingers suddenly, especially when you're using very soft clay, there's a good chance that you'll impart a large wobble into the rim or into the walls of the pot you're throwing. But simply, all I'm doing here is I'm gradually coaxing the clay outward, pull by pull, towards my throwing gauge, the pointer which you can see to the right of the screen now. I've set this at a particular diameter and height, 
so that when I'm throwing the bowls I can quite easily replicate them time and time again just by throwing the pot until the rim meets the pointer. Once I've thrown to my pointer I can begin to clean up the inside which I do just with the curved edge of a sharp metal kidney. Here I smooth out the surface and try to get it into one continuous nice curve. I don't worry if there are a few prominent throwing rings towards the top, as long as the curve is continuous. The glazes that'll go over top will smooth everything out thoroughly so I'm not too concerned by a few little throwing rings. Once the inside is done, I scrape away some of the slip on the outside. This isn't so much to correct the form, but rather just to remove wet slip that, if it remained, would otherwise cause the pot to dry much slower once removed from the wheel. Then I remove a skim of clay from the bottom, again just to neaten up the form and to remove any excess slip. I then also remove any accumulated slip from the bat. This just helps keep everything cleaner in the long run. It also stops the MDF bats from staying wet for too long, which can cause them to warp. I then chamois leather the rim, just to smooth things over. And finally, I drag a wire underneath, which is kept very taut so it doesn't accidentally remove more clay than I'd like from the bowl. I then take a very sturdy tool, screwdrivers work well for this job, and I pry away the bat from the skim of clay and lift it away to join the others. Once all the bowls have been thrown, I can set them aside to slowly dry out to leather hard, which in this current climate in the winter takes about a day or two. Once the bowls are sufficiently leather hard, and I can handle the pieces without distorting them too much, it's time to trim them. First, I set my pair of calipers to the desired diameter. This designates the width that my foot ring will be. I'll discuss many of the tools that you'll see during this segment towards the end, so stick around for that. The bowl is then tap centred into place. I then use three lumps of clay that I push down against the rim to secure the bowl into place. Whenever I'm pushing these pieces of clay into place, I take my other hand and hold onto the bowl just to make sure it doesn't move slightly as I apply pressure downward. I then take a pair of calipers and a sharp potter's needle and I score in the line. This is where my foot ring will start and then at last I can start to trim away the excess clay. Throughout this entire process I'm trying to keep my hands as steady as possible. You'll notice that whenever I'm trimming my two hands are connecting in some way, usually by a thumb. It's very easy when trimming to let the clay influence the movement of your tools, when in fact you want to trim in such a way that you completely ignore any of the clay's influence. If one lump comes around and you let your tool go with that lump, it'll just become more and more exaggerated with each rotation. So instead, you want to hold your tool in such a strong and firm way that you simply ignore any lump that comes along, trimming through it. And in some cases, especially if you're a beginner, these wobbles can be quite considerable, but even a well-thrown pot, as it dries, will move slightly, it will twist and undulate, so sometimes I'm having to contend with about a millimetre or two difference that I have to trim through to make it run true, and being absolutely in control is the key to trimming well. Not that you can see it so easily, but I'm also leaning my body weight onto my arms as I trim. I'm also anchoring my arms so that my elbows are tucked into my torso. These are two other factors which help me keep my arms as sturdy and rigid as possible. Once the outer walls have been trimmed, I can begin working on the foot ring itself. I trim my feet to have two facets on them. One will be left bare, and it'll also be where I stamp the pot with my maker's mark, whilst the other, which you can see here is sort of the groove in between the foot and the bowl, acts as a glaze catch. The groove allows the glaze as it fires to pull into it preventing it from spilling over the foot ring and onto the kiln shelf. Next, I can begin to remove clay from inside the foot ring. I grasp the trimming tool very firmly and I rest the wrist against my left hand. I then dig the sharp corner into the clay and very gradually ease it outward. This can be a make or break moment, as all it takes is for your trimming tool to catch badly once and you can very easily destroy your foot ring. So I try to take it relatively slowly. I don't remove all the clay at once, instead I take it away layer by layer, and as I'm working I test the thickness of the base just by poking it with my finger or tapping it with a tool to hear the resonance it makes. A low thud usually means there's plenty of clay for you to trim, but a high pitched noise usually means it's time to stop. Here I'm trimming the inside of the foot ring so that the facet mirrors the outside of the foot ring. 
This is particularly delicate work, and you can see that my hands are compensating for that by grasping together and working as one. These parts of the foot ring will remain bare clay once fired, so I like to ensure that they're nice and neat, whereas the interior part of the foot will be totally glazed, so if there are a few lines and marks there, I don't mind as they'll eventually be covered up. It's always a bit of a pain trimming the inside of a foot like this, as the coils of clay simply accumulate on your tool and onto themselves. That's why I'm blowing so much, as it dislodges them and pushes them out of the foot. This last little bit of trimming is really just to ensure that those surfaces are totally flat and clean and void of any of the wiring off marks that can be left on the clay when it's removed from the wheel. Once I'm happy with how it looks, I take my maker's mark and stamp the clay. This process does dislodge some of the clay upward, so I just have to do one last little trim just to make sure that the foot is completely flat. It's also the last moment to check any other sections of the pot that might need just one tiny trim. Thankfully, all the clay removed during this entire process is recyclable and I'll simply be able to slake it down in water until it becomes a sludge which can eventually be put onto a plaster bat, which absorbs the moisture and then wedged up again, ready to throw into new pots. I've made a video that shows that process in a lot more depth, which I'll leave a little link to now. I then flip the bowl over, check the thickness of the walls between two fingers, and if it passes, it can be put aside to dry out the bone dry, whereafter it'll be packed into the electric kiln to be bisque fired. Anyhow, here are some of the tools I've used. The first is my maker's mark my stamp, which I carved from a small block of porcelain and solidified up to cone 10. I made a whole bunch of these during my apprenticeship with Lisa Hammond, and they're some of my most sentimental and precious tools. Next is my bison potter's needle, which was gifted to me by Jono Smart, a good friend of mine. This thing is exceedingly sharp and deadly, and really, compared to all the other potter's needles I've used in my life, it puts them to shame. Next is a very basic trimming tool. Now, this is one that really there's nothing special about it. The metal wears out quickly, it blunts quickly, it isn't too sharp, but it does its job well for a while and I get through a number of these a year I'd say. And most pottery supplies will sell more or less the same thing. What I tend to care about more so is the shape of the loop itself. And as they tend to be quite cheap, I buy a handful, I use them, I wear them out, and then I move on to the next. The next one is more of a special one, but also a very simple one too. It's essentially a bent piece of angle iron which is then sharpened to a point and sharpened on the edges. I bought this one and a few others like it during my apprenticeship in Mashko, Japan. They can be quite difficult to source here in the UK, but they can also be made very easily, I think, just from basic materials. And it's an excellent tool for removing large quantities of clay from the outside of bowls and for trimming the interiors of the foot rings too. And lastly, is the trimming tool that I'm probably asked the most about. I was gifted this completely out of the blue from a ceramicist on Instagram known as Ovo Ceramics from Russia. He sent me a private message saying that he had made me a custom one, so graciously I accepted it, and since then it's probably turned thousands and thousands of pots. It's made from tungsten carbide, so it's very sharp, but very brittle, so I keep good care of this. It's very similar to a bison trimming tool, which I actually have a large order for, coming soon hopefully, and I cannot wait to use them. But for now, this is doing a pretty good job, but I can't wait to have different shapes and size tungsten trimming tools to work with too. Last but certainly not least is the throwing gauge which you guys are constantly asking about. These are made by my good friend Darren Ellis, whom I worked alongside with when I was Lisa Hammond's apprentice. They're built like tanks, and they even have a plastic filled layer in between the two struts of wood, which makes them last much longer and also makes them much sturdier. Anyhow, those are some of the trimming tools that I use. And here's just a few clips of the bowls as they approach being bone dry. And I'll include a photograph of a finished fired vessel too. Thanks so much for watching as always, and I'll see you next week.